Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jake, um, and I want to talk to you about our study entitled The Geography of Pokemon Go, Beneficial and Problematic Effects on Places and Movement. Um, but because there's so many things I want to talk about, uh, I'm going to peek at you a little bit throughout the talk just to make sure you're paying attention. Uh, no, but seriously, I get it's been a long day, so if you need to check Twitter or whatever, please just do it a, a weedle bit. Um, and I, I mean, I guess really what I'm trying to say is that I really like our results, and, and I think they're super interesting. And so for them to make sense, uh, I need you to pay attention, uh, and ultimately, you gotta catch them all. Um, but, <laughs> but seriously, here's a general outline for the talk. Uh, right now, I'm gonna walk through our motivation for this study and our underlying research questions. Um, for those of you who don't know about Pokemon Go, and maybe didn't get the jokes a little bit ago, uh, Pokemon Go is a location-based augmented reality game. Um, many have hypothesized that these kinds of location-based augmented reality technologies have the potential to fundamentally change aspects of human geography. Um, in particular, these studies hypothesize that location-based augmented reality systems have the potential to change human behavior along two fundamental dimensions, place and movement. Um, for context, Place refers to the physical and human aspects of a location, and movement primarily refers to the translocation of human beings, their goods, and their ideas from one end of the planet to another. Um, succinctly, this literature suggests that location-based augmented reality technologies, like Pokemon Go, may lead to shifts in the existing place or movement trends in society. At the time of our study, Pokemon Go was massively popular. Um, at its peak, it hit approximately 45 million monthly active users in the United States. And for context, Uber has about 15 million monthly active users in the United States. Um, but because of this immense popularity, uh, we saw, sorry, we saw an unprecedented opportunity to see if these hypothesized effects were true. Um, so formally, we ask, which types of places are advantaged and disadvantaged by Pokemon Go? And how has the movement of people changed because of Pokemon Go? So to study these questions and to make sure we could capture this moment in time, we needed to be careful about our study design. Um, so now I'm gonna tell you about the details here. Uh, we ran this study in the summer of 2016, right in the middle of the massive explosion in popularity. To capture this point in time, we developed a two-pronged approach. Uh, the first part of our study was a geostatistical analysis of in-game resources. And the second was a field survey of Pokemon Go players. Uh, each of these pieces were run simultaneously. And then I'm gonna talk about each of these in turn, starting with our geostatistical analysis. Um, and this was intended, again, to, to understand which kinds of places were advantaged and disadvantaged by Pokemon Go. Um, but to fully understand this analysis, I need to first talk to you about Pokestops. <coughs> Um, a Pokestop is, essentially, a location in the real world that players can visit in order to get more items, which are used for other elements of gameplay. Uh, players can't catch Pokemon or heal Pokemon after battles without the items provided via Pokestops. Put simply, Pokestops serve as resource allocation within this game. Um, but there's an interesting dimension about Pokestops that isn't obvious, but is important. The locations of Pokestops came directly from portals in another game called Ingress, which was also created by Niantic, Pokemon Go's parent company. Um, but in Ingress, the locations of portals, and therefore Pokestops, were organically crowdsourced. Uh, and remember this for later. Um, in our geostatistical study, we focused on Pokestop density as our variable of interest. Um, because Pokestops play a critical role in resource allocation, they proxy advantage in the game. Um, and we focused on density in particular, because Pokestop density makes Pokestops more readily available to players. Um, now those of you who have played the game know that there's a built-in time delay at Pokestops, uh, and a player can only reuse one after five minutes, um, which sets up a more subtle advantage for high density areas as well. Areas with high Pokestop density on your left allow people to travel between Pokestops much more easily um, and replenish their supplies more quickly, whereas people in low density areas cannot gather the same level of resources. Um, alongside our geostatistical analysis, the other prong of our study was our field survey. 
which was intended to give us a chance to understand movement and other aspects of gameplay. For two weeks during the summer of 2016, we deployed a team of people to conduct field surveys. Specifically, we surveyed 375 people in five different countries. Um, we ran this field survey between July 22nd and August 5th, right around the peak of Pokemon Go's popularity. Um, we developed our field survey so that each interviewer visited a location, uh, noticed people playing Pokemon Go, and asked them to participate in our survey. Uh, all interviewers had local knowledge of the area and selected their survey sites based on their own experiences of having seen people play there before. Um, and then all subsequent sites that they selected had to be one kilometer or more away from the prior site, and uh, interviewers spent at least an hour at each location. Um, and then to analyze our free text responses, we used an open coding approach. Um, specifically, our field survey focused on aspects of movement while playing Pokemon Go. We asked about things like whether or not players visited new locations, who they played with, um, whether they spent money, uh, risks associated with playing the game, and other questions intended to, to understand uh, behavior within the game. Um, so now that I've discuss, discussed the design of both prongs of our study, I want to move into results. And don't forget, you've got to catch them all. Um, to structure this section, uh, I'm going to discuss each of our research questions in turn. Uh, first, remember that we asked which types of places are advantaged and disadvantaged by Pokemon Go. Um, as we've seen from talks in this session, from other work our group has done, and from related literature, it's common for geographic systems like Pokemon Go to show place-based biases along two dimensions, uh, the urban-rural dimension and the race and ethnicity dimension. Um, in this study, we looked at how these two dimensions relate to Pokestop density and thus advantage in the game. Our geostatistical analysis findings show that Pokemon Go reinforces existing advantages in urban and white places. Um, specifically, I want to show you two plots. First is this plot. Uh, what you're seeing here is the average Pokestop density along the y-axis um, in each urbanness class um, at the county level. Each of these uh, classes has 20 randomly sampled counties within it for a total of 120. Um, just for context, urbanness classes are defined by the National Center of Health Statistics. Um, a one indicates most urban, a six indicates most rural, and the county we're currently in, Denver County, is a class one. Uh, the city of Boulder, a smaller city about 45 minutes away, has an urbanness class of three. And Jackson County, north and slightly west of here, uh, c uh, contains the Arapaho National Wildlife Refuge and has an urbanness class of six. Um, but to come back to this plot, the big takeaway is that the most urban counties in our sample have approximately 97 times more Pokestops per square kilometer than the most rural counties. More specifically, uh, the, the most urban counties have a mean Pokestop density of approximately 2.9 Pokestops per square kilometer, whereas the most rural counties have a mean Pokestop density of 0 0.03 Pokestops per square kilometer. Concretely, being in a rural area has, is a substantial handicap in this game. Um, the second plot I want to show you is this. Both of these maps show the city of Chicago. On your left, you see the map of Pokestop density, and darker colors indicate more Pokestops per square kilometer. On your right, you see a map of the demographic makeup of an area. A darker color indicates that a higher percentage of non-Hispanic whites live in that region. Um, the big takeaway from this figure is that demographically white areas have substantially more Pokestops per square kilometer than demographically non-white areas. This is a pretty striking visual because it's so clear, but this trend is statistically robust as well. Um, our geostatistical model, known as a spatial Durbin model, allows us to understand how attributes of geographically neighboring areas, like census tracts in our case, predict effects in a given tract. Um, so consider, for instance, for instance, a census tract, uh, the green cell here in the middle, um, in Chicago in a non-white neighborhood, where 0% of the population is white in all of the neighboring tracts. Tracts like this do exist in the south side of Chicago, just for context. Um, but the spatial Durbin model approach lets us say things like, if a massive demographic shift were to occur, 
and all neighbors became 100% white, our model predicts that the census tract in question would gain 21 Pokestops per square kilometer. Taking these two plots together, Pokemon Go advantages urban places and places that are predominantly white. Um, the other question we asked, remember, was how has the movement of people changed because of Pokemon Go? And so now I want to turn to some of our field survey results. For instance, we found that Pokemon Go can be a catalyst in, in changes in destination choice. Uh, this is important because many studies have shown that people's movement behavior tends to be very regular. Based on our field survey, 60% of people report Pokemon Go causing them to visit new locations, um, and 22% listed locations like parks, 14% listed places of interest like stadiums or castles, and 11% listed water features like public fountains. Um, further, 17% of people in the moment of being interviewed reported having never been to that location before. Just think about that for a minute. In your home city, or even your region that the city is in, how many of you would say you commonly travel to new locations? Granted, we're a unique bunch. We traveled from all over to visit a new, say, convention center. Uh, but, but this result is really surprising. Most people don't vary the locations they visit. Our field survey also suggests that Pokemon Go plays a role in where people spend money. 46, uh, specifically, we found some evidence that people started playing Pokemon Go, but because they were out and about, would end up doing something else. 46% uh, of our participants reported spending money while playing Pokemon Go. 23 specifically mentioned spending money on food. 25% specifically mentioned spending money on beverages. And 11% specifically mentioned alcohol. Uh, participants talked about paying for things like fast food and drinks in a beer garden, or while they're out, going to a bar to have a drink and cinema to watch a movie. Um, further still, our field survey results suggest that Pokemon Go is associated with group, not individual uh, movement. 70% of people reported always playing in groups, whereas 12% play exclusively by themselves. Um, the average group size was about 2.7 people, but 7% of people reported playing in groups with more than five people. Um, and finally, a number of news stories were flying around during the peak of Pokemon Go. Uh, you may remember them. <laughs> Most focused on how dangerous playing could be, and common themes included things like players being drawn into dangerous areas and then being robbed or attacked. Uh, for instance, Pokemon murder, lad beaten to death over Go game or gamers duped into virtual danger zone. Um, so in order to try to understand this dimension, we asked a few questions in our survey about risks and dangers that participants experienced while playing Pokemon Go. Um, however, what we found was surprising. The danger in Pokemon Go is largely due to movement and lack of attention, rather than the places people play. Um, approximately one third of people in our study ran into things, uh, like signs and, and poles and, and each other. Um, and 11% reported issues with traffic. Um, one example, uh, one of our participants said, I wasn't paying attention, and my boy ha boyfriend had to prevent me from stepping into the street. Um, however, only one participant reported an incident related to crime, similar to what the media had been reporting. This shows that actual events re related to crime are rare. Um, instead, the risks in Pokemon Go tend to be more sort of, quote, everyday troubles. Um, these are a form of risk that we as re researchers should consider. Um, so now that we've talked through the results, I want to move on and discuss high-level takeaways and implications for design. Now, earlier, I said Pokestops were organically crowdsourced. Remember this for later. <laughs> um, and as I discussed earlier, a growing body of work has shown that geographic biases pervade most geographic systems. This has been shown to be true in Wikipedia, in OpenStreetMap. Uh, some guy said this earlier about Twitter. And our results show that this is true in Pokemon Go as well. Um, broadly, it seems clear that using organically crowdsourced geographic data in your system means that you will have these geographic biases. Um, however, compared to something like OpenStreetMap, where addressing these biases means increasing peer-produced uh, content, it's probably relatively straightforward to modify these biases in a location-based game like Pokemon Go. Um, for instance, you might, uh, the, sorry, broadly these changes uh, fall into two categories. 
You might imagine adding new POCO stops at geographic locations that are more common in, in rural or non-white areas. Things like gas stations, stop signs, uh, even pull off areas on the side of the road on a highway. Um, on the other hand, you might imagine making the number of items a given Pokestop provides proportional to the Pokestop density in the area, which would help balance out the advantage in the game. Um, our findings also suggest that a large proportion of the risk from playing Pokemon Go comes from everyday movement troubles rather than the place-based risk. Um, this means that there are clear opportunities within the game to try to help mitigate this. Uh, so for instance, you might imagine making it less rewarding for people to run across roads without paying attention. Uh, you might also imagine in-game warnings where players are near or might interact with dangerous situations like busy roads or sharp changes in elevation like cliffs. And with that, I'd like to conclude and say thanks to Ashley and Alan, my uh, grad student co-leaders on this work, our other collaborators, particularly our field survey interviewers, our uh, study participants, and all of you for listening. Um, we have released our data for this study, and you can find it at this URL. Are there any questions? Hi, I'm Han. I'm Hi. from Brown University, and I really appreciate the presentation because I'm a Pokemon Go player myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like wondering, um, you've, you've mentioned about the movement, which is like people tend to go to places I've never been to just to catch certain Pokemon. Um, I was wondering if you have like any sort of investigation in the shift of um, choice of transportation. Um, so like I myself, I remember I would walk maybe like an extra mile just to hatch one egg. Or like, I don't know if you have thought about that. You know, I, this is an interesting question. Um, I, I, I'm, I'd have to go back and look at the data to see if we actually asked that question in our survey. Mm -hmm. um, for, uh, my understanding of the geography literature is that essentially people's movement trends, broadly speaking, tend to be very regular. Um, and so we may see some sort of shift like that, um, because partially and, and particularly as the game has added uh, barriers for playing while you're in a car, uh, for instance, you might imagine people beginning to shift away. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know that our data speaks to that directly, and I'd have to go back and look. Okay. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Uh, Jung Bak, Uppsala University. Okay. Uh, when you talk about movement between places, uh, to what extent do you talk about movement from place to place to place? Uh, and to what extent is it movement to one place and just staying there? Because we did a bit of observations of Pokemon Go, we have like, well, everybody else. Uh, and, and we saw that a lot of players went to one new place, uh, which was a kind of one zone that was good, and then they stayed there for a while. And that might have been a new place. But, but it was just one place. Yeah, um, I mean, our, so certainly our results suggest, again, you know, 17% of our participants, when we were interviewing them, were in a new place. Um, and, and given what we know about sort of uh, people's likelihood to, to go to new places. Um, you know, our surveyors were, were out on certain days at certain times, um, and, and this trend may, uh, may be, um, you know, more consistent, I guess, across time. Um, but, you know, I, I don't believe, um, I would have to go back and look again uh, at our data to, to see if we asked about that question specifically. Um, players did certainly talk about you know, moving uh, from playing Pokemon Go to go do other things um, and taking advantage of the Pokestops like on the way, right? Oh, hi. Um, my name's Angel. I'm from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, I had a question about, at least with, um, at, along the study, when you were at least surveying the participants and who was um, at least, uh, like you, you mentioned that there, the, these like divide between, I guess, uh, what is it? Uh, either with um, class or just like you, or like white or non-white mm -hmm. or like where the most Pokestop densities, like density was. So at least, did you see like at least who maintained, if who st stayed like playing Pokemon Go, and if that was, if there was 
any like uh, at least correlation with um, the amount of Pokestops present? So, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, we, we ran our study for two weeks, um, and it was sort of during peak popularity, right? And so I, I think the longitudinal question of who has maintained playing Pokemon Go over time is a very interesting one. Um, and, you know, I, I think we've, we've certainly talked about um, sort of follow-up work here to go and see who else is playing, see what else is going on, and, and just seeing if these trends maintain over time, right? So, so you might imagine people go visit new places for about a month uh, while Pokemon Go is popular, but then sort of fall back into their standard routines. Um, so so we, we've not done that work, but I think we'd be interested in it. 